On Capitol Hill right now, House members are getting a closed-door briefing on the prisoner swamp that freed Sergeant Bo Bergdahl and five Taliban detainees. We're also learning more about Bergdahl's condition and his captivity. Doctors say Bergdahl is improving. The senior official says he wants to be recognized by his old rank, private first class, which he held when he went missing. A Taliban source denies Bergdahl was abused or kept in a cage after a brief escape, and the FBI is investigating threats against Bergdahl's parents who have not yet spoken with their son. Let's get more from our chief national security uh, analyst correspondent, I should say, Jim Shuto, who's here with us in this situation room. Jim? Well, if I spoke today with David Rode, a journalist, uh, as you remember, who was held in Afghanistan himself by the, the Taliban and Pakistan in 2008, 2009, he told me he's been in touch with Bo's parents who have found all these stories and accusations surrounding their son, quote, heartbreaking. It's understandable, especially because so many of these stories have yet to be investigated, let alone confirmed. U.S. officials repeatedly cautioning patients, but in the meantime, Americans are hearing vastly contradictory accounts of who Bo Bergdahl really was. Today, military doctors at Landstuhl say his health is improving. But in the days since his dramatic release from the Taliban, the Pentagon, fellow soldiers, and Afghans have presented two vastly contradictory portraits of Bo Bergdahl. Deserter or good soldier? The first dispute arises from the circumstances of his disappearance. A military investigation found he had wandered off base more than once. Still, Afghan witnesses told CNN that the morning he was taken, he was forcibly abducted, beaten as he resisted. While some of his platoon mates allege he may have been trying to contact the Taliban. I heard it straight from the interpreter's lips as he heard it over the radio. Um, and at that point, it was like, I don't, this, is, this is kind of snowballing out of control a little bit. Um, there's a lot more to this story than just a soldier walking away. Were troops killed during the search for him? In the massive manhunt that ensued after he went missing, fellow soldiers say six troops were killed. Pentagon says there is no such evidence. Then there is his behavior during captivity, collaborator or survivor. Military officials tell CNN he attempted escape more than once, was held in a cage and physically abused. A Taliban source told CNN he sometimes played soccer with his captors, was allowed to celebrate Christmas and Easter, and even chose his own food, though U.S. officials have not been able to confirm this account. Do you want to humanize yourself so that the guards will start to trust you, so that when they stop watching you so closely, you can try to escape? A friend of the Bergdahl family and former Marine is pleading for time. And that's what I'm concerned about, you know, is that all the facts aren't out, and it's rushed to condemn him. For hostages, humanizing yourself may be a necessity. It establishes contact with the captors, and it's hoped makes them less likely to treat you, more likely, rather, to treat you humanely and, frankly, less likely to kill you. It also may be good strategy. Uh, David Roll told the story, Wolf, of how his translator, uh, his local translator who helped him escape, he played soccer with their captors. That built trust. The captors let him leave the compound occasionally, which allowed him to get the lay of the land, which helped them when they finally climbed over that wall and escaped and found their way to a Pakistani military outpost. So, so that kind of relationship, having some relationship with the captors, you know, it has value, it may even be, you know, necessary to survive. Jim, stay, stay with us because I want to bring in a leading expert on the Taliban who happens to be in Washington right now, Michael Semple. Spent many years in Afghanistan working uh, for the United Nations and the European Union. He's with the Institute for the Study of Conflict Transformation and Social Justice at Queen's University in Belfast. Uh, Michael, thanks very much for coming in. Glad to be here. Uh, you, you understand the Taliban about as well as anyone. These five detainees that the U.S. released are now in Doha, Qatar. Are they terrorists? No, they're not. They're not terrorists. They came to prominence in the Taliban movement before the current insurgency and before they, the Taliban got locked into its current terrorist campaign. They were uh, figures inside a movement which was fighting a bloody civil war inside its country, which is different from being terrorists. Did they give cover to al-Qaeda, to bin Laden? Ayman al-Zawahiri in Afghanistan, did they allow them to operate and plot and plan the 9-11 attacks on the United States? The fatal mistake which the Taliban movement, and particularly its leader, Mullah Umar, made was exactly this. And I was there at the time. I saw this happening. These five guys were involved in giving that, making that kind of fatal mistake, as you call it? 
no, they had no part in, the, in that decision making. It wasn't this kind of democratic organization where you stick your hands up and say, yes, this is a good idea or this is a, this is a bad idea. They were not part of the decision making around that. They were part of a movement whose leader had made that mistake. So Mullah Mohammed Omar made that decision and they supported that decision. It's the, kind of, it's the kind of movement where you can't say, excuse me, I don't like this. This was the kind of movement where as soon as the, the leader took a decision, everybody else had to fall in line. That was it. So do you believe they will now, after a year in Qatar, go back to Afghanistan, Pakistan, join up with the Taliban or the Haqqani network, which you yourself regard as a terrorist organization? First, I'd like to say that the, uh, the deal which has kept them off the streets, kept them in Qatar uh, for at least a year, is, a, is the best way that any release has been handled. I think that even these men themselves will be, they would rather be in Qatar, kept away from the conflict, rather than subject to peer pressure, being forced back into the, the ranks of the insurgency. Uh, who knows what's going to happen over the next year? Yeah, if, they, if the insurgency is still continuing uh, and if they're sent back to Pakistan and Afghanistan and the, the Taliban are still fighting a war, they will have to be part of it. Jim, you heard the Secretary of State John Kerry tell our own Elise Labatt over the weekend uh, when she had that exclusive interview of him that the U.S. will follow these guys, will monitor these guys. And he strongly implied that if necessary, if they go back on the battlefield, they could wind up dead. That's his contention. I, I think you know, the U.S. is going to do their best to, to track these guys down. You know, I think experience shows that's difficult once they're on the ground in a country like that. But, you know, the, the U.S. is well sourced there. It'll still have 9,000 troops on the ground through the end of the year. Uh, you know, th that's certainly a possibility, and I'm sure, I'm sure it's something that they'll do their best to do. Is there a real difference between the Afghani Taliban and the Pakistani Taliban? I raise the question because over the weekend we saw that horrible Pakistan Taliban attack on the airport in Karachi killing a lot of people. Yes, absolutely. That was wanton terrorism. And the Pakistani Taliban movement is a different organization. It operates differently. Of course, the, uh, the Afghan Taliban has been engaged. It has used terrorist tactics, particularly the, um, the Haqqani network has over the past few years. But there's a certain, you know, there, the, the Afghan Taliban movement has some political goals which the Pakistani Taliban movement doesn't, doesn't seem to have. Why would the Haqqani uh, terrorists who were holding Bergdahl for five years release him to the Taliban who in turn released him to the United States you come back you come to the the heart of the matter they clearly came under pressure from the other people in the movement and I think it's a case of so the the tail starting to wag the dog that the Haqqani saw an opportunity to become more important and to get more status inside the, the Taliban movement. They, I mean, they, they're basically uh, an obscure border clan which, because of patronage and backing, has become a lot more important uh, in Afghanistan and its insurgency. And now they start to look respectable inside the Taliban movement because they've delivered something that nobody else in the movement was able to. I know, Jim, uh, we've been questioning a lot of U.S. officials, and they say they have no evidence that Qatar or the Taliban paid off the Haqqani with money or something else. You're not hearing anything contrary to that, are you? No, no nothing about that. Are, are you hearing anything that maybe they were paid off with a lot of cash to free uh, Bergdahl? I think the politics and status are actually far more important. And if you follow terrorist organizations around the world, this is a common theme. The opportunity they get to show themselves as the people who are delivering inside the Taliban movement is more important to them than any money. Michael Semple, thanks very much for coming in. Thank you. Jim, don't leave yet. Jim Shudo, thanks to you.